Hello, everyone, and welcome to this um, next episode of the Akal and Coca Report. Today, we're going, we have a special topic. We're going to discuss the uh, Ioannidis affair, the um, charged controversy generated by Professor John Ioannidis of Stanford University with his editorial, with the position he took regarding the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, with the data that he's produced, with the consternation that uh, is ensuing from uh, his research among his loyal fo- or people who were allegedly his loyal fo- followers. And uh, to discuss um, this controversy, we, you know, who's better than um, um, our regular guests and experts, uh, Dr. Saurabh Jha, radiologist from University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Swaptail Hermath, nephrologist from University of Ottawa. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Great. Who wants to uh, to start? Saurabh, you're going to take the lead here. I, 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 can I interrupt? Oh, please. I, I think yeah. isn't the uh, the most important controversy is how do you say his name? Because you <laughs> say it Ionidis, and I always thought it was Ionidis. And I think how Saurabh has a different way of saying it. Ionidis. Ionidis. So uh, on, on, it we, seems he may be right because there's a YouTube video. I don't know if you guys have seen it. He put out a, however you say it. Professor JPA put out a YouTube video a few days ago, and he says, "Inidis, Inidis, <laughs> Inidis." Like, I don't know. I think Inidis. we need it's... we need Inidis. We need a yeah. randomized control trial here. Yeah. <laughs> well, most most of the most that. of the pronunciations are false. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> of, yeah. Good mostly one. Pop, Score mostly, one, Doctor Hermas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. So now that we've tackled that uh, major, uh, 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 you know, problem and the controversy, uh, Dr. Zhao, what, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts on, on what's going on with Dr. Ioannidis, with uh, what's happening to the EBM movement? Uh, is storm in a teapot or is it really something sensational that, uh, that is, um, you know, uh, uh, is the criticism uh, appropriate uh, and commensurate to, to the crime? Yeah, so that uh, last question is one I think we can dabble towards the end. But before before you go anywhere about the crime and how appropriate the response is, you have to just marvel at the irony. Irony of, um, it's almost like, you know, that passage from the Bible, those who live by the sword die by it, something like that. Mm-hmm. Those who live by this sort of, you know, um, evidence hype die by it. The, 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 the lad came into prominence um, by publishing a study that showed that 50% of the research is false. And he became, you know, he became a global phenomenon um, for stating something that I think we should all know that as science progresses, things that you thought were true um, aren't true anymore. And things that you thought weren't true are true. I, I think um, facts change. I think chemists and physicists would say, all right, mate. Welcome to uh, welcome to science and have a nice day. But somehow it became uh, it became a uh, uh, testament to our moral deprivation um, and lots of lots of secondary theories sprouted from that. Conflict of interest brigade emerged from that, and it was thought that you know we're methodologically weak and we have to. Um, tighten ourselves, and if we have the right amount of regulation, then things will be fine. That's correct. So um, let, let me, uh, for the audience, let me uh, just uh, add uh, to what you said for people who who may not know much about Ioannidis or Unidis or Unidis. So, 2005, he publishes this um, uh, editorial. I guess it was a lengthy, a lengthy essay, uh, making the claim that most research uh, is false and and uh, giving his reasoning. He was propelled to notoriety and fame. Um, after that, he was, uh, you know, on the on the uh, the cover of the Atlantic. He was on the cover of many magazines, and uh, he became sort of a, a darling of the evidence-based movement, or, or you know, a, a spearhead, or you know, a, a father figure, so to speak. Um, uh, so his criticisms are, are, you mentioned some of them. Uh, some of them are that the data is manipulated, frequently manipulated. Uh, the data is frequently um, you know, insufficient, uh, that we need better data. We should, it should be 
the data should be shared uh, with, you know, people should uh, open their data. I mean, that was a, he was a big proponent of, um, of sharing, uh, of data sharing. And, uh, and there may be some other claims that he's made um, uh, over the years. Um, but he, he's sort of, um, uh, he's viewed as an iconoclast uh, for making those statements and for, think, for taking those positions. I don't think I'd call him an iconoclast at all. I mean, I yeah, think I, I, right, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because um, he, he went and he, he became conventional wisdom. And after that, what he basically did was that he, um, uh, he's, he, he's a mathematician to the core, and he uh, believed that data can solve any problem. So I would see him opining a lot of things. He's opining on economists, and don't get me wrong, we all opine on economists. Um, he opined on radiologists. So how to reduce incidentalomas well, who better than Yinidis and his team to tell us how to do that? Mm -hmm. Which I found slightly <laughs> amusing that, you know, we've been thinking about this problem for the last 30 bloody years, but yeah, you, know, you just crunched some numbers, did some better research and said, how about reducing the field of view? Oh, <laughs> that was right. great, mate. So I'll but, have, you know, I'll have uh, two, two um, uh, on the show notes. Uh, we did two podcasts about uh, Yinidis, and now I'm converted to this pronunciation here. Yeah. One uh, with you, Dr. Ja. Uh, where we talked about the paper he did precisely about improving imaging so that there's less noise and more signal. And, uh, and one that uh, I think Anish and I did, uh, just the two of us, where he had a proposal that, uh, about the p-value, you know, the cutoff of 0 0.05 was insufficient. Perhaps we should have a cutoff of p.000005 to, to strengthen <laughs> the data and the evidence, um, that sort of thing. So we had these two podcasts. Um, uh, but go uh, ahead. And the point I want to make over here is that he's an extremely smart chap. Uh, the study that he did about the most published research being false, the type of meta research he does involves huge crunching of databases, lots of sophisticated statistical techniques, um, even though they don't really yield much more than what's descriptive. This is the way the world is, but that's fine. I mean, that's the whole idea of meta research, isn't it? To go above, take a 29,000 feet. The point is that whatever methods that he used, he used the same methods when confronting the pandemic. And this is where the problem arises. When people are criticizing him, one criticism is that he has made a point that you can't tell COVID related deaths, you know, the ones that, that of, of people dying from COVID, from those who die of or with COVID. He's applying the same frame that you do with prostate cancer and you do with breast cancer and DCIS to COVID. The same EBM frame, the same data driven, we need more research, we need more data, we need to reduce uncertainty. And fundamentally, if you believe a pandemic is a problem because of geometric spread, exponential spread, then this method is not a method that's going to be conducive to the pandemic. Now, you might believe that the lockdown is an overkill etc etc but whatever however you arrive at the situation once you accept that you're dealing with an infectious agent that multiplies then the usual rules of EBM we're not dealing with stents we're not dealing with DCIS we're not dealing with oh let's find out what the cause of the mortality was was it ischemic heart disease or was it you know myocarditis from chemotherapy we're not dealing with that nobody talks about person dying of Ebola or from Ebola in an Ebola infected patient. Nobody starts looking for all cause mortality in somebody with cerebral malaria. Things that have high fatality rates or infectious diseases with high fatality rates, you have to treat them differently. And so he's been applying the same EBM rules, the same Gaussian rules that he's been applying all the way up to now to this situation. And everybody's falling on their faces trying to say that he's wrong. Oh, if only the sample was more representative. Oh, if only they had adjusted for the uh, zip code, if only they used a confidence interval of specificity rather than two point estimates. No, that's not the issue, mate. That's just statistical nitpicking. The issue is that he's using the wrong frame for pandemics. He's well, using a Gaussian uh, stability frame. Of we gotta pandemics. hear 
I gotta hear swap before. before so I gotta hear swap. <laughs> yes. Because no, he's, he's on a rant. I, I, this is entertaining. I'm just listening. No, 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 no. Uh, he's, he's, he's made his point, saying that, that he, he's agreeing with you, Swap. Uh, he's saying that. Oh no, he, no, we don't agree. I know Swap is saying, gonna bring, saying, bring all the statistical impurities and all of this. He's saying no, JPA no. is totally wrong, but the reason he's saying JPA is wrong is because he's using he's using what sounds like a conventional EBM frame. Uh, yeah, for something see, I mean, for something that is otherwise bloody obvious. Yeah, exactly. Um, but even stepping back, right? He's uh, from the EVM point of view. Um, what he said wasn't really new. Even in two thousand five, uh, we know about you know publication bias. Uh, negative studies don't get published. We know about small study biases. Uh, smaller sample sizes. Studies are less likely to give you the truth, and so on and so forth. Uh, the beauty that, of course, JPA did is that he packaged it very nicely using fancy math that no one understood, and he put a very provocative title. Uh, so uh, there definitely is the, you know, again, I am I'm reading uh, psychology uh, uh, in his mind there. Uh, maybe it was the PLOS Medicine editors who did that, but there's definitely the attention-grabbing uh, headline that has been there uh, right from 2005 uh, until now, uh, and that's something that I would not uh, leave in this discussion. It, I think it's a very important aspect throughout. Um, personally, you know, in 2006 or seven, when I first came across that essay, it was like, wow, you know, someone big and important is saying this, this is phenomenal, right? This is a suspicion all of us have had, but someone to say using math saying, hey, this is the truth that most studies are false. Uh, and I, I, de I, I really did uh, respect him and I used to look forward to his papers and then it became kind of repetitive you know most radiologists are wrong most this kind of studies are wrong most that kind of studies are wrong uh, and the first uh, break for me was uh, I do mostly systematic reviews I have done some few small trials and cohort studies but I do a lot of systematic reviews and two years ago he published something saying most systematic reviews are false and I'm like, uh, it was a little personal. Uh, so I said, okay, let me look at it. Uh, most of his study are systematic reviews. He had at that point in August of 2018 uh, or March of 2018, he had published like 60 systematic reviews. So did he mean to say that most of his are also false or does the, the do these findings apply to other people and not to him? Like he's the only person who does uh, the right uh, kind of studies. And this is to uh, Saurabh's point is that you know, he's the final authority on every field, on every uh, every aspect of research and of medicine. Uh, what happened more recently, uh, and again, I'm not the only person. Uh, so when he, he, last year he published something on uh, these authors, uh, oh, these authors who have their names on many papers. Uh, and he got some, he put together some database about these authors and he was sort of saying, how can anyone publish so many papers? Um, the criticism uh, from someone pointed out that the cutoff was just one below where he would have made it to the top uh, <laughs> authors. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, those kind of things are, are sort of leave a bad taste in the mouth. You know, it's a, for someone you respect, there's no need to do these kind of, you know, studies. Um, a meta research is fine. Uh, but what happened now more recently is, uh, you know, there was first, there was a stat news piece in the middle of March where he wrote, hey, we need better data. And the kind of things he wrote, which really ticked me off, was that, A, fine, you need better data, and, and um, you know, there could be different schools of thought about who should, uh, whether we should be acting, whether there should be a lockdown or not. But there were a few things there which were kind of off. One of them was that, oh, uh, you know, this is just like the flu. Uh, and, and this was at the time when Italy was very clearly demonstrating that this is not like the flu. Uh, and despite that, he wrote that. And he said also that, oh, you know, own people with poor life expectancy will die. You know, that's the worst case scenario. Um, and that's something that that thread has lasted even in his uh, subsequent papers. Uh, and that's that ageism, uh, you know, like, okay. And I mostly deal with patients who have poor life expectancy. So he's sort of saying that, hey, you know, Swabnil's patients can die, who cares about it? Uh, he didn't say who cares about it, but that was the attitude in that uh, stat news piece that was very uh, off-putting for me. Um, uh, so, and a few days later, so I, uh, he, he got a lot of flack for that. Uh, so he went on the monk debates and I, I really did not want to listen to that. But a lot of people said, oh, he's really redeemed himself. Listen to him. And he, he just doubled down on all of that. And, and what he said in that, that I have some game changing data. He used that phrase, game changing, right? Uh, there, are, uh, you know, there are people who really love that phrase, game changing. 
So he said, I have got some game changing data that is going to change how all of you think about this. This is just like the flu. And a few days later on the 5th of April, uh, so he has published two papers in the last two weeks uh, in, the, in 10 days apart, really. So he's really a publishing machine, but you know, his, his findings are always true. Uh, so on 5th of April, he published something saying, uh, in young people, the risk of dying of COVID is uh, less than the risk of dying of a motorcycle accident. Um, you know, that kind of uh, comparison. And if you look at the stats, you know, again, Harry will make fun of me for saying this, but it's just made up. Like he, he took an arbitrary date and he said, okay, so many people have died in New York. Let's say maybe twice as more will die. By the time the paper came out, more than twice that number of people had died. He was very obviously wrong, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, no, no mea culpa. No going back and saying, hey, you know, okay, I was wrong in uh, saying what I did. No, so, so I, I agree. I, I, think, I think he got it wrong because of the fact that he didn't, he didn't uh, allow for the fact that uh, infections multiply, that they're not stable deaths, like thyroid cancer deaths over the years has had some st stability, which is how you know that there's overdiagnosis because you find all these cancers, you say, well, you can't really save more people than have died last year unless there's been more, suddenly more cancer deaths. So he's, the, the problem here is that he's applying the same frame so he, he, to this new situation. I mean, this situation, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, I think this is much more of a, um, much more of a rebuke to traditional EBM than it is to Unidus. Uh, well, because, mean, because, he, because traditional EBM doesn't adapt well in the sort of, Situation. The traditional EBM, the tendency is to say we need more in information, and that often is is correct. You do need more information in order to, uh, you know, uh, reduce your uncertainty intervals in order to reduce your both type one and type two errors. But here, you're, the reason why it's not the same is because you're dealing with asymmetric payoffs, and when you have asymmetric payoffs with time, the entire data collection process means you are in the situation that you are with him, where your number of deaths is wrong. So, so I'm slightly more charitable to him than most other people because I think that people aren't hitting the point of his mistake. And they're going around and using exactly the same frame as he's using, he's saying, ah, but if only that you did this better. And to give you one analogy, this is a bit like, you know, I don't know if you've, uh, maybe Swapnil has because he's from, uh, uh, he's lived in India, but if you've if you've actually uh, if you if you have people in your family who are very religious, and they tell you to do something uh, in order to gain something, you, know, you need to pray to God at four o'clock in the morning, and then you will get into Cambridge University. And so then you say, actually, I did pray to God at four o'clock in the morning, but I didn't get into Cambridge University. What went wrong? well, you only prayed for 10 minutes or you didn't mean it or you didn't do it. So, you know, the, the, the religious people, what they do is they keep changing the parameters within the religion. And this is what zealots do, the EBM zealots. They say, oh, but that's because he didn't adjust for the age. Oh, that's because he over adjusted for the sex. So that's because they used Facebook, hardly a random sample. Like, no, no, no. This is fundamentally wrong. These are little little quirks over here. You know, you, this is the sort of argument I get. Oh, use a p-test, not splines. Hmm. Oh my God! No wonder you screwed up. No, mate. Those are little tiny differences. Yes, I know there's a lot of statistical sophistication, but this is just bullshit. And this is what happens when you have the in crowd just basically saying you need to pray longer, you need to pray more in depth. You, you're still in the same frame. And that frame is incorrect. And what I think a lot of people aren't accepting is that the traditional Gaussian frame does not apply in pandemics or falls apart in pandemics. And when we try and do that, it's like, you know, trying to get uh, evidence for masks, trying to get, you know, should it be six feet, should it be eight feet? What is the evidence for social distancing? Oh, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're in a completely different realm over here. We're in chaos theory, butterfly effect, non-linearity, Ruin and Swapnil, I'm going to say this. See, Talib territory. <laughs> I, was, I was about to. Okay, now I press the button and Swapnil. <laughs> no, 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 but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I just, I just want to, I mean, if you read Unidus's 
at least some of his pieces. I haven't read. I think he has two preprints out and the stat piece, whatever. But I haven't. I haven't. I, I can't swap. Uh, you, you tell me if I'm getting things very wrong. But he, he is acknowledging exponential growth. He mentions that in his stat paper. He is saying that you can grow exponentially. But he is stuck on trying to quantify what exactly those numbers are so we can make good decisions. And he extrapolates from the Diamond Princess Cruise to say that, hey, look, I think the, the fatality rate is going to be very low. He estimates that, only, you know, in his thing, in his, in his little stat paper, he said, estimated that only 1% of the entire country would get infected. Um, meaning, and based on if only 1% gets, gets infected, that's 3 million people. 3 million, you know, he made some other estimate based on the Diamond Princess Cruise, what the fatality rate would be. And he comes up with some number that, you know, obviously we've, we've blown through. Um, but so the issue is not that he didn't understand the exponential growth of, thing, of this thing. He just got, he just, the assumptions he made seem to be, seem to be, seem to be wrong. Um, yeah, because yeah, the, the problem, he, yeah, the assumptions he made are wrong. Plus, uh, uh, sort of uh, along what Saurabh sort of said, is that he's stuck on these, the R0, the infection fatality rate, and the case fatality rate. And I'm not sure how much these rates matter. You know, like if you take the most optimistic scenario of, uh, of infection fatality rate of 0.1%, that still is a huge number of people who are dying, right? It's not something you can just shrug away and say, hey, it's like the flu. Uh, so he's comparing the infection fatality rate of COVID versus the infection fatality rate of flu. Uh, and let's say, you know, and, and most experts, we don't really know what is the IFR for flu because, you know, it's all sort of estimated. Yeah. Uh, but let's say it is the same. Most people say even if it's 0.1, it's 10 times the flu, but let's say it is yeah. the same. Uh, but most of us don't get the flu. Uh, a bunch of us are immune to the flu uh, and, and the flu shot works to a certain extent. So uh, it doesn't mean 300 million, million Americans get the flu uh, and they are not susceptible to the flu, but 300 million Americans are susceptible to COVID. It's a novel virus. So, you know, the, the, his one person assumption, which, you know, as you correctly point out, has blown through. Uh, if, if 300 million people are susceptible and 0.1% of them die, that's 300,000 people dead. Right. Uh, it's not no laughing matter. So his, his, his obsession with these rates, which, which you're right, cannot be quantified. Uh, and it varies. You know, I'm sure the IFR for New York is different than the IFR somewhere else. And the CFR varies based on density and who knows what else. Uh, and and uh, there are many other factors we just don't know. And he's he's searching for this truth, uh, which uh, maybe two years from now we'll know. Uh, Here's a question swap. So, uh, and, and this gets to this gets to why we're talking today about it because and we're talking today about it because you know Vinay Prasad and uh, Jeffrey Flyer uh, wrote another stat editorial talking about how uh, Ioannidis, because of his uh, uh, you know persistence in saying that the fatality rate is very low. In general, he seems to be somewhat more dismissive. He's not speaking in Taleb type terms uh, about uh, about coronavirus. Um, he's been he's been actively um, uh, dismissed by the uh, uh, by by a group of so uh, you know a group of experts in epidemiology and whatnot. And he's been dismissed not just not just in this kind of polite conversation we're having now, where we're saying that oh his assumptions are wrong or whatnot, but he's being dismissed. And, and the idea that he has a significant bias and he's unable to get beyond that that that, that bias, you know. So the comparisons are so, made. The comparisons so the, the, are made. The, but those to, comparisons are made by random people like me on Twitter. Like, who cares about my opinion and and Bobak or you know Carl Bergstrom or whoever? You know, we are making fun of him. We you know I posted a bunch of gifs about him, uh, and Bobak and I had a series about you know uh, uh, titles, uh, medical titles that uh, Unidis will write about. Uh, so we were just having fun. Uh, this is Twitter, right? We are sophomoric. Somebody called me sophomoric because I said I used <laughs> to respect him and I don't respect him anymore. Uh, then uh, when this motorcycle comparison paper came out, I said it doesn't have zero value. It has negative value <laughs> because I waste my time reading something like this. And, and Venk is going all over saying, oh, people are saying it has negative value. It is so disrespectful. Come on. <laughs> this is Twitter. I'm not, uh, this is not uh, the, the pages of uh, New no, but the question is: the, the question is, does that is that are we avoiding a serious discussion about about the assumptions are wrong? So, for instance, one uh, of the yeah. things to op, one of the things I, I'm I'm asking again, I'm 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 an expert on the WHO, but not on. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really I'm not I'm not a pandemic expert. I'm not an epidemiologist. But one of the interesting things that he said uh, was that um, you know the attribution of death um, is is. Um, is questionable when it comes to the flu, right? Meaning we don't we don't look this hard 
for the flu and attribute cause of death to the flu. So he made the point that, you know, there's a number yeah, of... Yeah, so he's, he said that people who uh, die with COVID may not have died because of COVID. And, and he's absolutely right. I'm sure some people come in and die of an MI and they also have COVID. And, and maybe they didn't die of the COVID and they died, truly died of their MI. Uh, but at the same time, I have... You know, there are patients who are dying and, and uh, no one has checked them for COVID. Uh, in, in my province, it just came out that people who died, they weren't checking them post-mortem for COVID. So I'm sure the attribution goes both ways that we are underestimating uh, the deaths from COVID and perhaps we are overestimating. Plus, of course, what the point that other people have made is maybe people are not um, getting medi- seeking medical attention uh, and they are dying of their you know, kidney failure or heart failure or who knows what. Uh, but it doesn't, right. doesn't take away. Like we will not know for sure. Um, does that mean right. that? Right. And, and then the point is that there's this, this large excess mortality in New York and it's Italy and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, they have these scenes. They have these scenes going on. But 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 but, but, it, but my, like, you know, the, the thing you know, there's he he points to and again he he's clearly looking for data that supports his point, right? So he's cherry picking yeah. things. So cherry pick. He he looks at you know there are 57 elderly people in 2016 2017 influenza season. Um, that mm-hmm. died, right? And in that autopsy series, um, influenza was detected only in 18% of those specimens. You know, mm-hmm. respiratory viruses were detected in about 50%. So the point is, some people who die from viral respiratory pathogens, more than one virus is found on autopsy. Sometimes there's some bacteria. So, so is that is there anything? You know, when we dismiss him out of hand, because he clearly has a, a very strong prior that he's attached to, and he's looking and adding, you know, building his little uh, castle of data from things that he picks. Are we, are we doing it some some type of disservice by saying by by say not even looking to see if that there's something valid about that, or or should we? Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying? Meaning beyond beyond what you're talking about in terms of <laughs> mortality related to lockdowns, etc. Is it possible, like? Like I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any discussion. And maybe the experts and, and the, the intensive care doctors and the pulmonologists, whoever it is, is the expert in this, think this is total bullshit and that's okay. But the problem is, I haven't seen a nice discussion or a nice little, little article or blog about, or from Bergstrom or whoever, saying, "Hey, you know, the chances, you know, this 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 idea that of all these people, for for instance, the difficulty we have act, uh, attributing deaths to the flu, right? We just assume these are flu-related deaths. But yet, when you do an autopsy series afterwards, you see that." You know, there's a significant percentage that may have different types of virus and stuff. So it's 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 possible there are other people that are dying of other things. So this this you know this thing that's basically cast aside and said this is bullshit. This is your flu brother uh, because you're saying you know every death that's COVID positive is because of COVID. Um, does there need to be some type of more you know gravitas discussion about that, or should or is that really just nothing? No, well, 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 let's. I think you've asked of. Uh, you asked an essentially good question. Should should you know this to be dismissed? And I don't think he should, because again, I think what he's highlighted to me underscores a very fundamental problem. And the problem. So let let me let me uh, pass this out. Here. The first issue was that you mentioned a while ago was the fact that he took some data and he calculated how many deaths there would be and he got it wrong, right? And that's fine. The problem here wasn't his point estimate. The problem here was he did not factor in the error that he would get and the asymmetry of the error that he would get and the asymmetry of the payoff. So again, we're not simply talking about the point estimate, numerator over denominator. We're talking about two other things. The uncertainty spanning both the numerator and the denominator, that's the first thing. And the second thing is the, um, is the payoff. So this is a scenario known as Jensen's inequality, where it's, you know, if you are five on one side and if you're five on the other side, they're not even. It could very well be that the error towards overestimating COVID is more than the error towards underestimating, but the point here is that it's not symmetrical. No, I know, but but then but then, Sarf, should we have? I, I know, I, I understand. So so let, so let me let me get to, let me get to the attribution okay. point. The attribution. No, no, but, but then I'm gonna wait. But before I get to the attribution yeah. point, but 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 if, if if and I meant to say something about this earlier in terms of you know precaution principle, Taleb, 
is that is that well then should we have shut down the entire world for SARS-CoV-1? Okay, so that is a very good question. Because because if we do that, if we do that every time, right, before we have scenes like Lombardy and scenes like New York happen, right, yeah. are we going to come that, out? I mean, that this, is, is, that is I mean this is the precaution principle acting the other way, right? Meaning, sure, that is a very good question. We, we may end up being losers if we end up stopping everything for Ebola, for SARS-CoV-1, for the next coronavirus that comes in. Sure, I would say that that is a very deep philosophical discussion, um, and it will require a bit more exposition about what the precautionary principle actually is, at what point does the, uh, do the errors start accumulating very much? I would say that that is why I'm reluctant to blame anybody for not taking action in January, um, because of the fact that uh, in January, it did not look that different from other, other SARS. And if you, were to take action, then you would have had to take action. You'd have to, have to say, we should have taken action here and we should have taken action there. But I do want to get back to your attribution point because I think it's part of the same problem. The problem is this. When you're trying to accurately attribute deaths to a certain, you know, uh, like death from cancer to cancer, death from ischemic heart disease to ischemic heart disease, remember you're not dealing with a perfect measuring instrument. You're dealing with an imperfect instrument. The more certain you're going to, you want to be, you know when people say, let's turn on the tap of rigor? Well, it doesn't work in a symmetrical manner. Rather, it doesn't mean that you'll just only be identifying the right, uh, you'll just be elevating the bar to um, making sure that you correctly identify those who died from cancer as due to being from cancer. It, do, it does mean that you will say that this person didn't die of cancer, but they did die of cancer. Do you see what I mean? So what I'm saying is that this whole attribution is part of the measuring instrument problem, where if you increase the rigor, if you say, okay, I will only take all cause mortality as proof of you know, evidence of an RCT. Sure, you will then make, you'll then not make an error in one direction, but you'll still make an error in the other direction. The problem here, is it is true that some deaths may be with COVID but as opposed to from COVID. But in order to determine that, in order to determine that, you will be missing a lot of deaths that are from COVID because no measuring instrument is perfect. And again, there's a difference. The difference is if you miss a few deaths that are not from uh, cancer, you probably don't make that much of a difference in the overall estimation, but here you can make a huge difference. Because again, here, the, there's asymmetry, the payoffs are asymmetrical. So I think we come back to the same issue, the measuring instrument issue. Third point I wanna make, and this is the last point I'll make before I'll let you resume your questioning, is that yes, it's true that some of the deaths are because of heart attacks that from people who uh, weren't getting into the hospital. That still is a relatively stable figure. And it is true that we don't have all the numbers, but it is also true that the sort of numbers that you're getting in Lombardy, the sort of numbers you're getting in New York, the sort of numbers that you're getting in the United Kingdom, they're not, they're not just the usual kind of, hey, it's April, let's have a few deaths type of numbers. It's visible, it's obvious. At some, at some point, you have to say that that's an avalanche coming. You don't have to prove that's an avalanche by measuring the velocity of every single snowball and saying it crosses a certain threshold and saying, ah, you're right, there's an avalanche. At some point, we've got to use our flipping common sense, right? And that's what I mean when I say the numerator is important. It doesn't mean the denominator is not important at all, but at some point, if it's so overwhelming, then it's so obvious, you have to explain New York. This is not just your usual April New York. When was the last time you experienced a flu season, influenza season? Now I, you know, I, I take ER call during December a lot. So lots of chest x-rays, lots of chest CTs. I can honestly tell you, there was never a time when you had that type of need a refrigerator, like some sort of serial killer movie to put body bags over there. So obviously we're dealing with a very unprecedented situation and to deny that 
I think that betrays an alarming level so, of judgment. No, no, no. So, so right. But let me let me offer a, an alternative hypothesis. And again, I, I don't know for sure, but I was very surprised when Yanides uh, came out with a stat news editorial before he produces data, because um, I viewed I would have if you had told me if you had asked me to predict. You know, Yonidis is going to take a position on this. Where do you think he's going to fall? I said, oh, for sure. He's a guy who's, you know, EBM, data guy, statistician, blah, blah, blah. All these guys are central planners. He's going to want lockdowns. He's going to want shutting down the, you know, he's going to want the experts to be put in charge of the whole economy, including him and that sort of thing. So to me, I was taken aback by the fact that he took that position um, against lockdowns. So my question to you is, is that actually, it's not that, okay, he made errors of, uh, you know, inference errors or, you know, errors of analysis, but they're primarily driven by the fact that he doesn't like lockdowns, <laughs> you know, that in some weird way, he's kind of a libertarian in that, in that respect. And so then if, if you don't like lockdowns, if you don't like government interventions, then you will find reasons. You will say, okay, there is New York, there's Lombardy, but look, there is Singapore and there's this. And you will say, hey, wait a minute, we don't know enough to, uh, to intervene and, and we need to find, you know, we need more data and so forth. So, so you're going to, you know, cherry pick your data, whichever way you want, but it's driven really primarily by a, a, a political uh, agenda, so to speak. Now, I don't know that for a fact because, uh, you know, I don't know the guy. He doesn't strike me as being particularly libertarian. In fact, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that, that, that he's not. But, but that may be, the, what, to me, that could be the main factor that is coloring his his approach that he just doesn't like lockdowns and he wants to find ways out or, or ways to change the course of things. Uh, well, my, I, I don't my, know. Yeah, I can't say what is his, his uh, original, uh, I can't really think, uh, look into his brain. Um, so, but, but there's a phrase that James Heathers, I think you've had him, uh, the data thug, mm -hmm. that you've had him uh, on your show. He used uh, that phrase on Twitter and I'm not saying it applies to, to anyone specific, but he said there are many poorly informed attention sponges um, who have been, uh, you know, voicing their opinion about what should be done and what should not be done. Uh, you're absolutely right, right? This is for infectious disease people uh, and epidemiologists who look at how pandemics spread and they should be the one who should be talking and not necessarily me and Anish and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Saurabh as well uh, are talking about these factors, but we are all opining. Uh, and and someone, some people just have the contrarian streak, I guess. That was my feeling, at least when I saw it. Uh, but but stepping back a little bit more, um, it's not like I have to, you know, you took some pot shots at EBM. Uh, so I have to defend it to a certain extent. I don't think, like, if you look at EBM, uh, someone, I was arguing with Andrew, Andrew Foy, who said, oh, JPA is the EBM guru. And I have no idea where that comes from. He's not done a single trial. Uh, you know, EBM is basically doing randomized controlled trials uh, for interventions. Uh, so I don't know how you can call him an EBM guru of all, of all things. Uh, but uh, for, for this, this particular situation for COVID, you know, prediction and modeling, that's not really EBM. Uh, there is no, it's kind of prediction. Uh, and, it, and as you can see, some of the predictions have failed massively and some have been uh, not unreasonable. Um, for, for EBM, uh, we can do better and some people have done better. So, uh, you know, I've, I've always pointed to the UK where uh, despite all their feelings, uh, there is this recovery trial, it's called recovery, where they have enrolled more than 7,000 patients um, as a country. Uh, and that's phenomenal. You know, there are some advantages to having uh, a centralized system like that, where I think it's a, it's a very well-run uh, clinical trials unit at Oxford who managed to pull it off to, to have these kind of, uh, in comparison to that, in the US, we have all these mini trials. You know, there are these, I don't know, 30, 40 hydroxychloroquine trials. Uh, and, and I don't think they will give you any kind of useful information uh, compared to uh, the recovery might be able to give you. Uh, so EBM is, you know, it's not the final answer for everything, but uh, when there is, even if there is a pandemic, uh, you can get good answers by uh, doing uh, clinical trials. And that has been somewhat disappointing. Uh, I would say is that a lot of people are, are uh, even people I respect have been using anecdotes, you know, oh, there is clotting, let's use this, let's use heparin, let's, you know, there is something really strange going on. Let's put in TPA. And I agree that if you talk to the thrombosis guys, uh, and I'm not a thrombosis expert, uh, you see hyperinflammation in COVID and in states of hyperinflammation, uh, thrombosis, you know, inflammation leads to thrombosis as a, as a phenomenon physiologically. 
biologically. So uh, there is nothing new about this. It's just that, you know, you see a hundred cases in one, you know, in, in, in one week and it, to, to you, it feels like this is something different. It probably is not. Um, anyway. No question. We, but, but so Michelle, I mean, just uh, building on Michelle's point um, and responding to Swap about, you know, uh, giving this to the pandemic experts to handle and getting cardiologists, especially out of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and oncologists. <laughs> <laughs> oncologists. The, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a citizen or a small business owner, et cetera, not a pandemic person. Um, clearly stopping the economy may result in financial crisis, civil, civil, you know, civil strife, um, you know, kind of tearing of the social fabric in multiple different ways. Uh, you know, and clearly that's what Clearly, that's what Unidas thinks. I mean, it's obvious Unidas, I mean, this, Michelle brings up that up beautifully, right? He wrote the editorial before he produced the data to support it, right? So he obviously, he thinks strongly that the, the therapy for this, you know, extended over the long term is going to be very bad, right? And he wants, and, and his job, and he, he sees himself kind of, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, he, he's, he's passionate, he's a zealot in terms of producing data to support his his uh, his position and convince people and influence people uh, that you know we should be opening up sooner, etc. So how do you? So given we know that that that's a fact, but if 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 that was you, Swap, how would you go about generating data to support your position that we should open up? The lockdown is on balance going to be bad. How how would you as an EBM guy go about doing it? I don't know that uh, necessarily an EBM is the right framework. Uh, I agree, EBM is not uh, is, is not necessarily the right framework to think about that, mm. uh, about this issue at all. What people have been doing, of course, is looking at other places which are opening up and seeing what happens, right? So you've seen um, uh, Singapore and Japan uh, seem to be doing well, uh, but then their cases have been going up in the last week. Uh, whereas uh, South Korea is not. So I, I guess that's the best we can do is to extrapolate from other places that have that. that and, and I think uh, Christos used that uh, phrase uh, uh, maybe at the podcast with you or with someone else is that uh, we are often, this is like the light coming from a distant star. Uh, so we can use that sort of phenomena where other places are uh, a few weeks or a few months ahead of us and we can see their experience and, and yeah. uh, extrapolate. Though US is, you know, is completely different in many different yeah. ways. It's it's like Europe put together. Um, yeah. So uh, what happens those in guys, New York? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe different than what it, happens in you know South. Right. Dakota. So then, so then the pandemic guys. So what are the pandemic guys? I mean, with pandemic guys, as far as I see, Bergstrom, etc. They're like you know model you know modelers and and speak to what happens when pandemics get in. But this is all without precedent. We've never tried mm -hmm. lockdowns on national scales and stuff. Aren't they just then like what are they? What is the basis? For, like when I you know. Like me and Michelle, when we treat somebody with angina, right? We at least have some. Well, Michelle has many decades more than me, but we at least have some. some decades. Uh, <laughs> we have some. Yes. We have some well of experience plus whatever we whatever we've read, etc., to well, rely on, right? Are you worried, well, about, that, well, are you well, worried that, is, that there isn't some well of experience that they have to rely on? They're kind of just. Well, Anish, Anish, the thing yeah. is that. Um, How, yeah. The thing is, you know, you say, well, what's the what's the data? Yeah. I think I think I think you're cheekily trying to put salt on the EBM wound by saying yeah. empiricism cannot uh, advise this. But if you talk about data, I mean, what's the data with war? What's the data of the yeah. dangers of actually having a world war? I mean, we we yeah. um, we have two massive data right. points in the last century: the yeah. data from pandemics um, throughout Europe uh, is pretty strong. It's very strong that when the bubonic plague came out, it wiped a third of the population of Europe. Now, we're in, a, we're in times where two things have happened. Medical care is much more, well, three things have happened. Medical care is much better. Uh, four things, there are fewer rats. Uh, right. Medical care is much better. Right. Uh, people are living longer and therefore right. they are much more prone right. to infections and we're more interconnected than before. So whilst it took a traveler some time to get from the Levant to Italy. Yeah. Now you can go from Wuhan to Philadelphia right. um, in, you know, in 14 to 16 yeah. hours. So 
we have we have sufficient evidence that pandemics aren't something to be right, taken but, lightly. Right. Now, I, I do want to point one other thing out, which was the point Michelle made about you know this, and I want to say that I don't think the guy has a political bias. Yeah, no, yeah. that right. uh, that would be my guess. And I also think that I don't think he's cherry picking data necessarily, although that's very uh, that's very hard to prove. I think he's looking at the data from the frame of numerator denominator. He's comparing infections to road traffic accident, and he's doing nothing abnormal. You know, I don't know if you remember the Ebola epidemic. It's back a few years ago. Didn't quite come to America in the same way. I think we were quite lucky. But there were idiots that were tr comparing your risk of getting Ebola to being killed by the vending machine. Um, and these idiots yeah. published in the Washington Post. I can find you papers, uh, pieces written by that saying, oh, you need to worry more about being killed by a vending machine <laughs> than, uh, than by being killed by, uh, you know, by Ebola, to put things into perspective. And so this type of putting things into perspective is nothing new. What was, what was ironic about the Ebola time was there was all the conservatives who were getting their knickers in a twist, obviously because you had a Democrat president and all the progressives saying, calm down, calm down, you stupid idiot. Here's some empiricism. They were doing exactly what you know this is doing right now. Exactly the same thing. That's what they said, oh, but that's what I say. That, that oh, the R naught was different is a different situation. We applied evidence. Bollocks. Uh, right. I mean, so, you so, were so, using so, exactly the same frame. Yeah. The conservatives were behaving exactly like the progressives. It was unbelievable. It was like taking a mirror and everybody changing roles and saying, right, we're going to be idiots on this occasion and we're going to be idiots on this occasion. Right. So, it's so, unbelievable. So, so that's exhibit A of, of, um, of the critique, the critique of EBM, uh, generally, or empiricism generally, you know, which, which would be what, what people you know, not just uh, randomized control trials and whatnot, but but the people who would say we need the data, it's the data that will allow us to to know how to act. When in fact, it's just it's never just the data. It's always the data with whatever other considerations that you have, right or wrong, and they may be very valid considerations. But but the data itself doesn't uh, doesn't really cut it. It doesn't doesn't make the difference. Oh, no. And in that sense, you're right that that. Um, Yoannidis is uh, is consistent, is consistent, Absolutely. right? It's consistent Absolutely. in in uh, wanting to show that it's the data driving yeah. the boats, right? That is the. No, and, I, and I think this charge that he is somehow cherry picking data is fundamentally disingenuous. The guy is doing what empiricists have done all along. He's taken the infection. He's compared it to road traffic accidents. He's made no categorical differences between the two, simply numbers speak for themselves. And this is a great example of where numbers don't speak for themselves, where you, where you have partial information and you have to make decisions based on what you think could be the worst case scenarios. This is exactly what India did. India didn't faff, you know, faff around. Now you might disagree with India's action, but the point is that India's actions could not have been informed by data because by the time the data would accrue, the slum in Dharavi would have been exploding with body bags if well, that infection was right. bad. To, if that infection wasn't bad, then it'd be like, well, I was right. But you see, you have you, the counterfactual that you avoid is one that you can never prove that existed because you avoided it. I'll give you another example, Michelle. This, you might not like this example, but I'll still think it's an important example. After 9-11, George Bush went after Afghanistan, the Taliban, right? I'm talking about the Iraq war, I'm talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Taliban, you know, going after mm -hmm. Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Now, the rationale for that was the same rationale that you have for treating a small PE, that the next one could be a massive one and kill you. So the next 9-11 and the next to next 9-11 and the next to next to next 9-11, four 9-11s and the country would have gone into anarchy and there would be complete destruction of social fabric. So, and, but you can't prove that. You can't prove what didn't happen. You could always say, ah, but you'll say that. What's the proof that it's gonna happen? And this is the thing when you have to make decisions to avoid counterfactuals. I, 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 I couldn't, be, I, I couldn't uh, uh, agree with you more because all these things are historical events and history doesn't repeat itself. 
And so, but, but to wrap things up, let's say we have the UI needless position versus the, the rest of the uh, EBM world. When, when do we adjudicate whether one, you know, who, who, who was the wisest at what time, time point? Uh, at this point? Uh, I mean, because it's clear that right now one can say, look, the lockdowns are working, you know, it's much less than, than uh, you know, much, much less worse than it could have been. Or do we look at it a year from now, two years from now? What's, what's, say, what's he, the time frame for, for, uh, yeah. for deciding who's, who's, who, who got it right? So if you see the stat editorial from today, it's obvious that he's wrong, right? Um, uh, everyone accepts that Unidis is wrong. So the, the argument has changed now. It's like, oh, how dare you people talk to him about, uh, talk about him in this, uh, you know, in this impolite way. There are all, all these ad hominems and you guys are making jokes about him and uh, you're stifling his voice, which I find amazing, uh, given that he's got a YouTube video. He's appeared on Tucker Carlson and Fox News, which is like, which is more coverage than CNN uh, or Washington Post or New York Times could ever give you. So there's no way his voice is being stifled. He's, his voice is all over uh, the country and the world. Uh, his YouTube videos have had many thousands of views. Uh, he's writing for Stat News. He's got this, this flattering uh, profile in the Wall Street Journal, which talks about, you know, he likes to paint and he likes to write literature. Uh, and you kind of wonder reading that, what is going on here? Uh, are you, why are you writing like this about him? So there's, there's no way, all, the, the argument is changing, right? Be nice to him because he's obviously wrong. So I think they, he, there is no question about him being right or wrong. And, and I would, again, I would, I'm not sure I like the framing of him versus EBM. Um, EBM is more about trials. This is nothing to do with trials. This is kind of, you know, more about the economist versus the epidemiologist kind of uh, prediction argument. I think, uh, yeah. So, but, 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 but it's fun to answer that question. This is beyond what there's. There's no. There are no. There are no real great data points. I mean, if you try to, it's basically over quantification to try to try to make some sense of it number wise because you know the goal is to avoid New York, et cetera. So, but but then how does how does somebody who has this uh, has a basis in trying to quantify or you know which is what Ionidas is? How does one how does one uh, how does one approach it? Like how do you like how do you know, how do you know what what is the best thing what is the best thing to do? Are you, are you just deferring to ex, the experts or I, I'm not. I, I totally agree yeah. with you know the discussion so far is that yeah uh, and, and people have said that even the ID the infectious disease yeah. and the epidemiology guys have said is that uh, our biggest success will be if nothing happens uh, and then everyone will blame us for for stopping the economy. Uh, I, I, we have said that we we really don't know. The counterfactual you can uh, sort of extrapolate from what has happened in you know sweden for example uh, yeah. or perhaps what is happening in brazil or ecuador but again you know we are not brazil so, we are not ecuador. so in answer to michelle's question um at the end of two years everyone will claim victory <laughs> no at the end of two years at the end of two years people will say that um the the lockdown was uh, an overkill when you see the excess deaths from cancer coming over in two years, when you see the um, economic damage, uh, when you see the, the uh, consequences of um, having another $2 trillion in debt and relying on Chinese buying the bonds, um, it'll be concluded. And nobody will know what was averted. And nobody will know what was averted. And nobody will also, people will also won't know the the next pandemic is the one you need to obviously worry about, the, more, the one that's even more uh, virulent, that has an even higher infection fatality rate, for you, an even higher R naught. And how you prepare for that is what's going to really determine. But uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that I would blow off that easily. I mean, I think that we've kind of been, we were, we were lucky this far. We were lucky to have gotten away with, um, uh, with, with, with uh, swine flu, and and the, but we weren't so lucky with this, and the next one could be even worse. So uh, so you know maybe I've been watching too many Netflix movies about um, pandemics, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of these viruses. Yeah, well, I, I think it'd be nice to have some. You know, my, my only issue with the whole conversation with Unidas and 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 you know some of the folks you mentioned is that. Uh, uh, I think, you know, people like Andrew Wakefield, 
um, you know, these people fabricated data, whatnot. Um, and clearly, there should be no discussion, I think, by any intel intelligent people about Andrew Wakefield and his studies. Um, for whatever I reason, the, I, think I think the issue was that, you know, you, one of the investigators wife was, you know, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, recruiting right. patients. Uh, so the, the, the data quality is, is, uh, it's not know, the, great. I, the, I, yeah. it's, it's but, awful. But, but I think he's a smart guy. Unlike Wakefield who, well, I mean, Wakefield, I guess Wakefield is married to some <laughs> model, isn't she? So maybe he is a smart guy. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, the point is that he, is, he does bring up some very interesting things. And maybe I find it interesting because, you know, I've, I've, I've always, you know, as a, as a contrarian. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've kind of through, throughout this course, I've been super worried about, you know, the, the downstream effects of what happens when you shut down the economy and who, who, you know, printing all this money and where, you know, what do we do long term, blah, blah, blah. But so, so, you know, I, I have a soft spot for anyone who pushes back against the conventional uh, uh, thinking, but there are some really interesting points of discussion that I don't, I don't, it doesn't see, it doesn't feel swap like are being fleshed out in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I think people good. have been thinking about it. Like when yeah. he said, oh, no one's thinking about opening up the economy. Oh, everyone yeah. has been thinking about opening the economy. Yeah. Scott Gottlieb had a thread on it, like, I don't know, a month ago saying, oh, yeah. these are the things we need to have. Uh, so there are many other smart people who have been thinking about opening up the economy. It's, it's not that he's the only, you know, uh, person. And, and these, the attribution of debts and all that, you know, there are, like Harry said, there, there are many different ways of skinning the cat and all of us will come with different numbers. Right, right, right. Well, Christos, you know, the one good discussion point that Christos brought up is that we probably need to kill all the cats, you know. Christos, <laughs> the, the pets, you're not, the you're pet, not a cat person, I guess. Pets. And I, I'm sure Christos, you know, being the Greek dictator that he is, is very serious. On that note, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and um, to be followed. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.